Hello everyone, Thersites the Historian here. I had originally intended to do part one of my biography of Basil II this week, but I didn't have enough time. Instead, I thought that I would bring you another selection of H.G. Wells' The Outline of History. Initially, I was not sure how good this part would be. H.G. Wells can be a little hit or miss. After all, the guy is an amateur who has no real background in history, at least beyond the casual. Yet, it appears that his understanding of Roman history, at least in the late Republic, is pretty impressive, even by modern standards. Even a hundred years after it was written, his account here is perfectly plausible. While I, as a professional historian, can easily quibble with a few details here or there, his overall portrait of Rome is actually very solid. He seems to have a good familiarity with the sources, and he also understands the role of money in politics and also how the system was very much rigged against the lower classes in terms of how people were allotted into the voting tribes. Also, the first sections where he describes Rome's problems and its voting system, its corruption, etc., is remarkably germane to today. The problems, as H.G. Wells lays them out, of a lack of representation in a democratic system, or at least a, quote, democratic system, as he would say in the text, is brilliantly expounded upon, and even a hundred years after H.G. Wells is writing, almost everything that he says is still applicable to today's world. And the two examples that he uses for comparison with Rome are the U.S. and Britain, and again, those two countries still face the same exact problems that they did in 1920 in regard to representation and the enactment of the people's will. So I hope that you will enjoy this section of H.G. Wells' writing. I think that this is his finest prose and also his finest analysis of the entire work so far. So I proudly present to you H.G. Wells' take on Roman history from the Gracchi down to the death of Sulla. We have already twice likened the self-governing community of Rome to a Neanderthal variety of the modern democratic civilized state, and we shall recur again to this comparison. In form, the two things, the first great primitive essay and its later relations, are extraordinarily similar. In spirit, they differ very profoundly. Roman political and social life and particularly Roman political and social life in the century between the fall of Carthage and the rise of Caesar and Caesarism, has a very marked general resemblance to the political and social life in such countries as the United States of America or the British Empire today. The resemblance is intensified by the common use, with a certain inaccuracy in every case, of such terms as Senate, Democracy, Proletariat, and the like. But everything in the Roman state was earlier, cruder, and clumsier. The injustices were more glaring, the conflicts harsher. There was comparatively little knowledge and few general ideas. Aristotle's scientific works were only beginning to be read in Rome in the first century BC. Ferrero, it is true, makes Caesar familiar with the politics of Aristotle and ascribes to him the dream of making a Periclean Rome. But in so, doing so, Ferrero seems to be indulging in one of those lapses into picturesque romance which are at once the joy and the snare of all historical writers. Attention has been already drawn to the profound difference between Roman and modern conditions due to the absence of a press or any popular education, or of the representative idea in the popular assembly. Our world today is still far from solving the problem of representation and from producing a public assembly which will really summarize, crystallize, and express the thought and will of the community. Our elections are still largely an ingenious mockery of the common voter, who finds himself helpless in the face of party organizations which reduce his free choice of a representative to the less unpalatable of the two political hacks. But even so, his vote, in comparison with the vote of an ordinary, honest Roman citizen, is an effective instrument. Too many of our histories dealing with this period of Roman history write of the popular party and of the votes of the people and so forth, as though such things were as much working realities as they are today. 
but the senators and politicians of Rome saw to it that such things never did exist as clean and wholesome realities. These modern phrases are very misleading unless they are carefully qualified. We have already described the gatherings of the popular comitia, but that clumsy assembly in sheep pens does not convey the full extent to which the gerrymandering of popular representation could be carried in Rome. Whenever there was a new enfranchisement of citizens in Italy, there would be the most elaborate trickery and counter-trickery to enroll the new voters into as few or as many of the 30 old tribes as possible, or put them into as few as possible new tribes. Since the vote was taken by tribes, it is obvious that, however great the number of new additions made, if they were all got together into one tribe, their opinion would only count for one tribal vote, and similarly if they were crowded into just a few tribes, old or new. On the other hand, if they were put into too many tribes, their effect in any particular tribe might be inconsiderate. Here was the sort of work to fascinate every smart knave in politics. The Comitia Tributa could be worked at times so as to vote altogether counter to the general feeling of the people. And as we have already noted, the, the great mass of voters in Italy were also disenfranchised by distance. About the middle period of the Carthaginian Wars, there were upwards of 300,000 Roman citizens. About 100 BC, there were more than 900,000, but in effect, the voting of the popular assembly was confined to a few score thousand residents and in and around Rome, and mostly men of a base type and the Roman voters were organized to an extent that makes the Tammany machines of New York seem artless and honest. They belonged to clubs, Collegia Sodalicia, having usually some elegant religious pretensions, and the rising politician working his way to office went first to the usurers and then with the borrowed money to these clubs. If the outside voters were moved enough by any question to swarm into the city, it was always possible to put off the voting by declaring the omens unfavorable. If they came in unarmed, they could be intimidated. If they brought in arms, then the cry was raised that there was a plot to overthrow the Republic, and a massacre would be organized. There can be no doubt that all Italy, all the Empire, was festering with discontent, anxiety, and discontent in the century after the destruction of Carthage. A few men were growing very rich, and the majority of people found themselves entangled in an inexplicable net of uncertain prices, jumpy markets, and debts. But yet, there was no way at all of stating and clearing up the general dissatisfaction. There is no record of a single attempt to make the popular assembly a straightforward and workable public organ. Beneath the superficial appearances of public affairs struggled a mute giant of public opinion and public will, which sometimes made a great political effort, a rush to vote or such like, or broke into actual violence. So long as there was no actual violence, the Senate and the financiers kept on in their disastrous way. Only when they were badly frightened would governing cliques or parties desist from some nefarious policy and heed the common good. The real method of popular expression in Italy in those days was not the comitia tributa, but the strike and insurrection, the righteous and necessary methods of all cheated or suppressed peoples. We have seen in our own time, in various European states, a decline in the prestige of parliamentary democracy and a drift towards unconstitutional methods on the part of the masses through exactly the same cause. Through the incurable disposition of politicians to gerrymander the electoral machine until the community is driven to explosion. For insurrectionary purposes, a discontented population needs a leader, and the political history of the concluding century of Roman republicanism is a history of insurrectionary leaders and counter revolutionary leaders. Most of the former are manifestly unscrupulous adventurers who try to utilize the public necessity and unhappiness for their own advancement. Many of the historians of this period betray a disposition to take sides, and are either aristocratic in tone or fiercely democratic. But indeed, neither side in these complex and intricate disputes has a record of high aims or clean hands. The Senate and the rich equestrians were vulgar and greedy spirits, hostile and contemptuous toward the poor mob, 
and the populace was ignorant, unstable, and at least equally greedy. The Scipios in all this record shine by comparison, a group of gentlemen. To the motives of one or the other figures of the time, to Tiberius Gracchus, for example, we may perhaps extend the benefit of the doubt. But for the rest, they do but demonstrate how clever and cunning men may be, how subtle in contention, how brilliant in pretense, and how utterly wanting in wisdom or grace of spirit. A shambling, hairy, brutish, but probably very cunning creature with a big brain behind. So someone, I think it was Sir Harry Johnston, has described Homo Neanderthalensis. To this day, we must still use familiar terms to describe the soul of the politician. The statesman has still to oust the politician from his lairs and weapon heaps. History has still to become a record of human dignity. Another respect in which the Roman system was a crude anticipation of our own, and different from any preceding political system we have considered, was that it was a cash and credit using system. Money had been in the world as yet for only a few centuries, but its use had been growing. It was providing a fluid medium for trade and enterprise and changing economic conditions profoundly. In Republican Rome, the financier and the money interest began to play a part recognizably similar to their roles today. We have already noted in our account of Herodotus that a first effect of money was to give freedom of movement and leisure to a number of people who could not otherwise have enjoyed these privileges. And that is the peculiar value of money to mankind. Instead of a worker or helper being paid in kind, and in such a way that he is tied as much in his enjoyment as in his labor, money leaves him free to do as he pleases amidst a wide choice of purchasable aids, eases, and indulgences. He may eat his money, or drink it, or give it to a temple, or spend it in learning something, or save it against some unforeseen occasion. That is the good of money, the freedom of its universal convertibility. But the freedom money gives the poor man is nothing to the freedom money has given the rich man. With money, rich men cease to be tied to lands, houses, stores, flocks, and herds. They could change the nature and locality of their possessions with an unheard of freedom. In the third and second century BC, this release, this untethering of wealth, began to tell upon the general economic life of the Roman and Hellenized world. People began to buy land and the like, not for use, but to sell again at a profit. People borrowed to buy. Speculation developed. No doubt there were bankers in the Babylon of 1000 BC, but they lent in a far more limited and solid way. Bars of metal and stocks of goods. That earlier world was a world of barter and payment in kind, and it went slowly and much more staidly and stably for that reason. In that state, the vast realm of China has remained almost down to the present time. The big cities before Rome were trading and manufacturing cities. Such were Corinth and Carthage and Syracuse. But Rome never produced a very considerable industrial population, and her warehouses never rivaled those of Alexandria. The little port of Ostia was always big enough for her needs. Rome was a political and financial capital, and in the latter respect, at least, she was a new sort of city. She imported profits and tributes, and very little went out from her in return. The wharves of Ostia were chiefly busy unloading corn from Sicily and Africa and loot from all the world. After the fall of Carthage, the Roman imagination went wild with the hit hereto unknown possibilities of finance. Money, like most other innovations, had happened to mankind and men had still to develop, today they have still to perfect, the science and morality of money. One sees the thing catching on in the recorded life and writings of Cato the censor. In his early days, he was bitterly virtuous against usury. In his later, he was devising ingenious schemes for safe usury. In this curiously interesting century of Roman history, we find man after man asking, what has happened to Rome? Various answers are made, a decline in religion, a decline from the virtues of the Roman forefathers. Greek 
intellectual poison, and the like. We, who can look at the problem with a large perspective, can see that what had happened to Rome was money. The new freedoms and chances and opportunities that money opened out. Money floated the Romans off the firm ground. Everyone was getting hold of money, the majority by the simple expedient of running into debt. The eastward expansion of the empire was very largely a hunt for treasure and strong rooms and temples to keep pace with the hunger of the new need. The equestrian order in particular became the money power. Everyone was developing property. Farmers were giving up corn and cattle, borrowing money, buying slaves, and starting the more intensive cultivation of oil and wine. Money was young and human experience and wild. Nobody had it under control. It fluctuated greatly. It was now abundant and now scarce. Men made sly and crude schemes to corner it, to hoard it, to send up prices by releasing hoarded metals. A small body of very shrewd men was growing immensely rich. Many patricians were growing poor and irritated and unscrupulous. Among the middling sort of people, there was much hope, much adventure, and much more disappointment. The growing mass of the expropriated was permeated by that vague, baffled, and hopeless sense of being inexplicably bested, which is the preparatory condition for all great revolutionary movements. The first conspicuous leader to appeal to the gathering revolutionary feeling in Italy was Tiberius Gracchus. He looks more like an honest man than any other figure in this period of history, unless it be Scipio Africanus the Elder. At first, Tiberius Gracchus was a moderate reformer of a rather reactionary type. He wished to restore the yeoman class to property, very largely because he believed that class to be the backbone of the army, and his military experience in Spain before and after the destruction of Carthage had impressed upon him the declining efficiency of the legions. He was what we should nowadays call a back-to-the-land man. He did not understand, and few people understand today, how much easier it is to shift population from the land into the towns than to return it to the laborious and simple routines of agricultural life. He wanted to revive the Lycanian laws, which had been established when Camillus built his Temple of Concord nearly two centuries and a half before. So far as they broke up great estates and restrained slave labor. These Lycanian laws had repeatedly been revived and repeatedly lapsed to a dead letter again. It was only when the big proprietors in the Senate opposed this proposal that Tiberius Gracchus turned to the people and began a furious agitation for popular government. He created a commission to inquire into the title of all landowners. In the midst of his activities occurred one of the most extraordinary incidents in history. Attalus, the king of the rich country of Pergamon and Asia Minor, died 133 BC and left his kingdom to the Roman people. It is difficult for us to understand the motives of this bequest. Pergamon was a country allied to Rome and so moderately secure from aggression, and the natural consequence of such a will was to provoke a violent scramble among the senatorial gangs and a dispute between them and the people for the spoils of the new acquisition. Practically, Attalus handed over his country to be looted. There were, of course, many Italian business people established in the country and a strong party of native rich men in close relations with Rome. To them, no doubt, a coalescence with the Roman system would have been acceptable. Josephus bears witness to such a desire for annexation among the rich men of Syria a desire running counter to the wishes of both king and people. This Pergamum bequest, astonishing in itself, had the still more astonishing result of producing imitations in other quarters. In 96 BC, Ptolemy Appion bequeathed Cyrenaica in North Africa to the Roman people. In 81 BC, Alexander II, king of Egypt, followed suit with Egypt, a legacy too big for the courage if not for the appetite of the senators, and they declined it. In 74 BC, Nicomedes, king of Bithynia, dem demised Bithynia. Of these latter testamentary freaks, we will say no more here. 
of these, but it will be manifest how great an opportunity was given Tiberius Gracchus by the bequest of Attalus, of accusing the rich of greed and of proposing to decree the treasures of Attalus to the commonality. He proposed to use this new wealth to provide seed, stock, and agricultural implements for the resettlement of the land. His movement was speedily entangled in the complexities of the Roman electoral system. Without a simple and straightforward electoral method, all popular movements in all ages necessarily become entangled and maddened in constitutional intricacies and almost as necessarily lead to bloodshed. It was needed, if his work was to go on, that Tiberius Gracchus should continue to be tribune, and it was illegal for him to be tribune twice in succession. He overstepped the bounds of legality and stood for the tribuneship a second time. The peasants who came in from the countryside to vote for him came in armed. The cry that he was aiming at a tyranny, the cry that had long ago destroyed Melius and Manlius, was raised in the Senate. The friends of law and order went to the capital and state, accompanied by a rabble of dependents armed with staves and bludgeons. There was a conflict, or rather a massacre, of the revolutionaries, in which nearly 300 people were killed, and Tiberius Gracchus was beaten to death with the fragments of a broken bench by two senators. Thereupon, the senators attempted a sort of counter-revolution and proscribed many of the followers of Tiberius Gracchus, but the state of public opinion was so sullen and threatening that this movement was dropped, and Scipio Nasica, who was implicated in the death of Tiberius, though he occupied the position of Pontifex Maximus and should have remained in Rome for the public sacrifices which were the duties of that official, went abroad to avoid trouble. The uneasiness of Italy next roused Scipio Africanus the Younger to propose the enfranchisement of all Italy, but he died suddenly before he could carry the proposal into effect. Then followed the ambiguous career of Gaius Gracchus, the brother of Tiberius, who followed some tortuous policy that still exercises the minds of historians. He increased the burthens of taxation laid upon the provinces. It is supposed with the idea of setting the modern financiers, the equites, against the senatorial landowners. He gave the former the newly bequeathed taxes of Asia to farm, and, what is worth, he gave them control of the special courts set up to prevent extortion. He started enormous public works, and particularly the construction of new roads, and he is accused of making a political use of the contracts. He revived the proposal to enfranchise Italy. He increased the distribution of subsidized cheap corn to the Roman citizens. Here we cannot attempt to disentangle his schemes, much less to judge him. But that his policy was offensive to the groups who controlled the Senate, there can be no doubt whatever. He was massacred by the champions of law and order, with about 3,000 of his followers in the streets of Rome in 121 BC. His decapitated head was carried to the Senate on the point of a pike. A reward of its weight in gold, says Plutarch, had been offered for this trophy, and its captor, acting in the true spirit of a champion of big business, filled the brain case with lead on its way to the scales. In spite of these prompt, firm measures by the Senate, the Senate was not to enjoy the benefits of peace and the advantages of a control of the imperial resources for long. Within ten years, the people were in revolt again. In 118 BC, the throne of Numidia, the semi-barbaric kingdom that had arisen in North Africa upon the ruins of the civilized Carthaginian power, was seized by a certain able Jugurtha, who had served with the Roman armies in Spain and had a knowledge of the Roman character. He provoked the military intervention of Rome, but the Romans found that their military power, under a senate of financiers and landlords, was very different from what it had been even in the days of the younger Scipio Africanus. Jugurtha brought over the commissioners sent out to watch him, the senators charged with their prosecution, and the generals in command against him. There is a mistaken Roman proverb, pecunia non olet, money does not stink, for the money of Jugurtha stank even in Rome. There was an angry agitation, and a capable soldier of lowly origin, Marius, 
was carried to the consulship 107 BC on the wave of popular indignation. Marius made no attempt on the model of the Gracchi to restore the backbone of the army by rehabilitating the yeoman class. He was a professional soldier with a high standard of efficiency and a disposition to take shortcuts. He simply raised troops from among the poor, whether countrymen or townsmen, paid them well, disciplined them thoroughly, and 106 BC ended the Seven Years' War with Jugurtha by bringing that chieftain in chains to Rome. It did not occur to anybody that, incidentally, Marius had also created a professional army with no interest to hold it together but its pay. He then went on to hold the consulship more or less illegally for several years, and in 102 and 101 BC repelled a threatening move of the Germans, who thus appear in our history for the first time, who were raiding through Gaul towards Italy. He gained two victories, one on Italian soil. He was held as the savior of his country, a second Camillus, 100 BC. The social tensions of the time mocked that comparison with Camillus. The Senate benefited by the greater energy in foreign affairs and the increased military efficiency that Marius had introduced, but the sullen, shapeless discontent of the mass of the people was still seeking some effective outlet. The rich grew richer and the poor poorer. It was impossible to stifle the consequences of that process forever by political trickery. The Italian people were still unenfranchised. Two extreme democratic leaders, Saturninus and Glaucia, were assassinated. But that familiar senatorial remedy failed to assuage the populace on this occasion. In 92 BC, an aristocratic official, Rutilius Rufus, who had tried to restrain the exactions of the financiers in Asia Minor, was condemned on a charge of corruption so manifestly trumped up that it deceived no one. And in 91 BC, Livius Drusus, a newly elected tribune of the people, who was making capital out of the trial of Rutilius Rufus, was assassinated. He had proposed a general enfranchisement of the Italians, and he had foreshadowed not only another land law, but a general abolition of debts. Yet for all this vigor on the part of the senatorial users, land grabbers and forestallers, the hungry and the anxious were still insurgent. The murder of Drusus was the last drop in the popular cup. Italy blazed into a desperate insurrection. There followed two years of bitter civil war, the social war. It was a war between the idea of a united Italy and the idea of the rule of the Roman Senate. It was not a social war in the modern sense, but a war between Rome and her Italian allies. Allies equals Socii. Roman generals, trained in the traditions of colonial warfare, marched ruthlessly up and down Italy, burning farms, sacking towns, and carrying off men, women, and children to sell them in the open market or work them in gangs upon their estates. Marius and an aristocratic general, Sulla, who had been with him in Africa and who was his bitter rival, both commanded on the side of Rome. But though the insurgents experienced defeats and looting, neither of these generals brought the war to an end. It was ended in a manner, 89 BC, by the practical surrender of the Roman Senate to the idea of reform. The spirit was taken out of the insurrection by the concession of their demands in principle. And then, as soon as the rebels had dispersed, the usual cheating, of the new voters by such methods as we have explained in section one of this chapter was resumed. By the next year, 88 BC, the old round had begun again. It was mixed up with the personal intrigues of Marius and Sulla against each other, but the struggle had taken on another complexion through the army reforms of Marius, which had created a new type of legionary, a landless professional soldier with no interest in life but pay and plunder and with no feeling of loyalty except to a successful general. A popular tribune, Sulpicius, was bringing forward some new laws affecting debt, and the consuls were dodging the storm by declaring a suspension of public business. Then came the usual resort to violence, and the followers of Sulpicius drove the consuls from the forum. But here it is that the new forces which the new army had made possible came into play. King Mithridates of Pontus, the Hellenized king of the southern shores of the Black Sea east of Bithynia, was pressing Rome into war. 
one of the proposed laws of Sulpicius was that Marius should command the army sent against this Mithridates. Whereupon Sulla marched the army he had commanded throughout the social war to Rome. Marius and Sulpicius fled, and a new age, an age of military pronunciamentos, began. Of how Sulla had made himself commander against Mithridates and departed, and of how legions friendly to Marius then seized power, how Marius returned to Italy and enjoyed a thorough massacre of his political opponents and died, sated of fever, we cannot tell in any detail. But one measure during the Marian reign of terror did take did much to relieve the social tension, and that was the abolition of three quarters of all outstanding debts. Nor can we tell here how Sulla made a discreditable peace with Mithridates, who had massacred a hundred thousand Italians in Asia Minor, in order to bring his legions back to Rome, defeat the Marians at the Battle of the Colline Gate of Rome, and reverse the arrangements of Marius. Sulla restored law and order by the prescription and execution of over 5,000 people. He desolated large parts of Italy, restored the Senate to power, repealed many of the recent laws, though he was unable to restore the canceled burden of debt, and then, feeling bored by politics and having amassed great riches, he retired with an air of dignity into private life, gave himself up to abominable vices, and so presently died, eaten up by some disgusting disease produced by debauchery.